Good evening. We're so happy to have you join us once again as we enter into yet another lesson with our spiritual director, Father Jerry Farfa. And I'm again pleased to have with me my brother Keith Patrick. Today we continue to talk about the Eucharist as covenant as we get into intensifying and deepening the meaning of the Mass to us and how we can best benefit from it. Uh, in the publication now to Vatican II, the formation of the laity, it said that the sacraments do not merely express the faith, but also nourish and strengthen it. And we talk about divine grace, which flows from the Paschal mystery. The document goes on to say that the Eucharist and the sacrament of reconciliation are of paramount importance at every level of daily life. And the Eucharist is described as the source and the summit of Christian life. You perhaps would remember that old hymn, uh, the hymn that we sing at the adoration of the Eucharist, or Salutaris, for those of you who are in the, the long time days of the Latin. In English, O priest and victim, Lord of life, throw wide the gates of paradise. We face our foes in mortal strife. Thou art our strength, O heed our cries. And the more modern hymn, let us enter into covenant with Christ, celebrating the Eucharist of love. We're so happy to have as our spiritual guide our very good teacher, Father Jerry Farfer, and like a good teacher, he will take us back to what we covered last time as we proceed into examining the new covenant today and prepare for the third part of our series next week. Father Farfar. Thank you very much, Celia, and once again, I'm very glad to be here talking, I suppose, on my favorite theme. The theme of covenant, not just covenant, but the Mass as covenant. And while our series is really directed towards the discussion of the Mass, it's, the Mass is like, like the summit, mm -hmm. you know? Yes. And you can't get to the summit without so. going through the trials mm -hmm. and tribulations of the base mountains and getting to the base camp and then to a higher base camp. Last week we had the, the, reached the base camp for the long discussion on, on covenant and we saw the meaning of the, of the original sin and the fall. This week, we're getting a little closer to a consideration of the Mass as covenant. We're going to talk about the new covenant and in the context of the old covenant. At the back of our minds, we are constantly reminded that when Jesus gave us the Mass, he gave it to us as explicitly in the context of covenant. He said, this is the new covenant in my blood. That's what he said at the Last Supper. He gave us the Mass in the terms of covenant. Now, we, often enough, we Catholics at Mass, we are, we are simply dazzled by the reality of the bread and wine becoming the body and blood of Christ. Yes. Because the priest says that, mm -hmm. this is my yeah. body, and holding the host, and then holding the cup, he says, this is the cup of my blood. And then we focus on that, the bread and wine, ah, they become the body and blood of Christ. And we miss the next bit. This is a cup of my blood of the new and everlasting covenant. Mm -hmm. And we have four accounts of the Mass, the institution of the Mass in the, in, the, in the scriptures, in the New Testament, and all four of them bring in that point, that the Mass is in the context of covenant. So um, to understand the Mass, we need to understand covenant, and that's what we discussed on the last occasion that I was here. And um, we saw a lot of applications of that covenant. But one of the things I would like to stress is that the covenant is a, uh, it's a commitment, okay? It's a relationship. It's a word describing a relationship. And now a relationship always has to have the two sides to a relationship. Nobody says, I'm related. You have to say, I'm related to what? Yes. Or to whom? Mm -hmm. Okay. So there are two sides to this relationship, and then there is a basis for that relationship which draws them together. Now, sometimes, because of the basis of the relationship, it's, it's a, what we call an, a, a natural relationship that doesn't require any further expression other than the fact that it just exists. For example, you have the relationship that exists between children and their yeah, parents, and child, yes. mm -hmm. okay, or between a brother and a sister. That. None of them, they don't have any choice anymore, right? They're born into that family, and they are, these are your brothers, these are your sisters. You don't have to agree. Sometimes you don't have to like it. But the fact of the matter is that the relationship exists. But that's a natural covenant, a natural relationship. 
But then there are the very important relationships in our lives which are voluntary. And when the Bible speaks of covenant, it nearly, nearly always, probably always speaks of a voluntary relationship. And the example we have for that is, is simple friendship. If some of you might, might come up with some other examples. Marriage. Marriage, marriage yes, a very good example of a voluntary relationship. And a relationship that doesn't have to exist, but does exist yes. between one person and another, or one God and a people. And there's a basis for that relationship. Marriage, hopefully, the basis is love and trust. And, you know, it's, it's important. Now, how is the relationship the, expressed, or is it important for it to be expressed? It is vital for it to be expressed. I think last week, last week, two weeks ago, I gave, we gave the example of the fellow who came to me and said, Father, that, you see that girl over there, she's pretty, huh? And I said, yes, she's very pretty. He said, Father, that's my girlfriend, you know. I said, boy, how are you so lucky to get a girl so? <laughs> and he says, well, I said, what does she have to say about it? Father, I don't know, I can tell her yet. That relationship doesn't exist, it has to be expressed. And unless a voluntary relationship is expressed, it just doesn't exist. In marriage, you have the exchange of rings, you have the exchange of vows, it has to be expressed. Even if you come down to a sale in a shop, for goodness sake, you have to express. You want your relationships being established between you and the, and the person behind the counter. Okay? You offer the person money, the person offers you the goods, the covenant is these goods are now yours, that money is now yours, and the whole thing is symbolized by the action. People have contracts, they sign a contract. You know, all these, a voluntary relationship is something that has, that has to be expressed. And it is no different with covenants and God. And this is one of the most important things to understand about our relationship with God. It, it is voluntary, he calls us to it. We can always say no, he calls us to this relationship. And, um, and that's what the Mass says. If, if we say no, Father, if, if perchance we say no to that uh, relationship that God wants with us, what, what's the consequences? Separation from God, mm -hmm. if it is an important matter, if we are called to do something important, and we say no to God on that one, well, we, are sep we sever our relationship with God. Okay. And the consequences of that can very well be eternal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, Adam and Eve said no to God. Okay, and through all of us in the bamboo. Now that was a very yeah, important yeah. relationship, that, a, a result of their saying no to God. So that um, the relationship has to be voluntary and it, a voluntary relationship is gonna have to be expressed. Now you see that mainly, I will not mention it much again tonight, but I assure you when it comes to the mass, the, the next talk when we're talking about the mass, this is going to be a central point of the discussion. Mm -hmm. the, how do we express a voluntary relationship with God. Yes. So uh, the relationship either establishes new obligations if, uh, or build an obli on, on relationship, builds an obligations that are already there making them deeper. For example, marriage. Before marriage there are, uh, they, they, well, there's engagement. And when the time comes to the marriage, the, the obligations are deeper and longer lasting. It elevates the standard of the obligations, but obligations always go with a mutual and voluntary relationship. There are the obligations on both sides. So that's an important point, Father Father, if I may interrupt. Um, we often think that we have obligations to God, but God has also undertaken to carry out. I'm glad you mentioned that's them. perfectly true. How often do we think that God's obligations towards us? Okay? God doesn't have to have obligations towards us, but if he chooses to have them, then he has them. Mm -hmm. And when God calls us into a relationship with him and we acquiesce, we agree, that we establish mutual obligations. And... Uh, what does that mean for us? Well, that's what we'll be talking about a little later this evening, so if you could just wait for a little on that question. <laughs> okay. So now what we're talking about is... is um, Initially, God called Adam and Eve into a relationship. Okay, I am your God, he says. He says, and he, you know, he, he gave them their freedom because he said to them, you know, you can eat from any tree you like in the garden, but you see, that tree, don't even think of touching it. 
the day you touch it, you're going to die. So while he gave them the freedom, because he said, you're not to touch it, but if you touch it, he recognized that he, he, he's still leaving them free. And then they had to make their own decision. They had to agree that God was their God with authority over them. And they said no to that. And they said, we will not serve you. They didn't say those actual words, but equivalently. And in the, in the uh, prophecy of Jeremiah, he uses those words about the early days of, of man and God and mankind. You said to me, he said, that you will not serve. So that that, that is where we got, that is one of the main things I made last week. And to remind us of that, I think we have, I, I have, I have prepared a drawing. I did the drawing on the board the last day, but I have it here now, much nicer, I think, on your screen for you. And these in my primitive way of drawing, if you don't mind. Uh, this is, represents the world. And the two people there are Adam and Eve, and please don't ask me which is which, right? One of them is Adam, and one of them is Eve. You can take my word for that, okay? So there you have Adam and Eve. And then uh, what they did, they adopted, as it were, uh, this is my way of putting it, okay, to explain mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. They adopted a national flag for the human race. Now, what's a national flag? A national flag is a rallying point. You go to the Olympics and you want to say, hey, all Trinidadians, you know, come, gather. Where are you going to tell them to gather? Look for our flag. And everybody yes. come. And then everybody wearing a little image of the national flag on them so people know who is Trinidadian and who is not. So Adam and Eve, as it were, chose a national flag. Not a very pre prepossessing flag, right? But nevertheless, they chose a national flag for um, the human race. But they didn't just choose a flag. Trinidad not only has a flag, we have a motto. Together we aspire, together we achieve. They too chose a motto. And sadly, their motto is, I will not serve. Now, I will not serve, can't fit on the flag. So I put it in Latin, it's shorter, but it means the same thing, okay? Non serviam means I will not serve. And you find that in, in Jeremiah, chapter 2, verse 20. But, but Father, isn't that a very strong... Uh interpretation of uh, their rebellion, uh, say, putting it in the context of, I will not serve. Well, that's what they said. Why don't we just look at it as, well, it was a mistake they made. And well, it couldn't have been just a mistake that they made because it got received very strong punishment, which was separation from God. God exiled them from the Garden of Eden. Okay. And, you know, as a child, I remember thinking, you know, well, I'm disobedient to my parents, no big thing. <laughs> Right? So why, because Adam and Eve are disobedient to God, they get us into so much trouble? Well, it is just that, you see, Satan said to them, he said, don't believe God. Okay. He says to you that, uh, that you must not eat the fruit and because you're going to die. But Satan says, I am telling you, you're not going to die. Okay. What's going to happen mm. is that you will be like gods and you will be able to make up your own minds about what is right and what is wrong. And then Adam and Eve, wanting to be like God, wanting to be able to make up their own mind about what is right and what mm -hmm. is wrong, yeah. said, we're eating the fruit anyway. Yeah. You, you see you up there, Lord, you mind your business, right? You see yes, us down yes. here, you gave us a free will, we're going to eat that fruit. I know you said not eat it, we're yes. eating it anyway. And they sided with God's enemy. Satan was God's enemy. And that is rebellion. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's how they use their freedom. It, 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 yes, they, they, it was really an abuse of the freedom that God gave them. God gave them that freedom to show that they loved him and were serving him because they wanted to. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, you know, God created all the animals and all the plants and all the planets and the sun and everything. And everything else does what God wants of them. You know, the earth goes around the sun, the earth spins on its axis, the sun goes around whatever the center of the galaxy yes. is. We hear it's a big black hole these days. But everything does what God wants. We have plants, we have plants in the studio, the stems grow up and the roots grow down. They do what God wants just because they have to do it. And then God says, you see, you know something? I'm going to make someone in my own image with freedom, with intelligence. And they're going to serve me, not because they have to, but because they want to. And he created us. And this is what happened. Okay. We will not serve. And they sided with Satan against God. So you have the non serviam the, the, the motto of the human race there. So what happens as a result of that? The, the motto, I will not serve. Well, as we said, it's rebellion. Not just simple disobedience, but rebellion. Mm -hmm. 
see that. Now, as children of Adam and Eve, we are born to them. You see us coming into existence here next to Adam and Eve now. There we are. So now it's the human race standing beyond or below that flag mm -hmm. of rebellion against God. Now, as a result of their rebellion, Adam and Eve were exiled from the garden. We are told in the Bible that they were. God drove them out of the garden, mm -hmm. and then he wouldn't let them come back in. He put an angel there with a flaming sword to um, prevent them, lest they find their way back to the tree of life. So they were in exile. Well, think of it. If we rebel against the government of Trinidad and Tobago, and we are expelled from the, and they send us to some uninhabited island in the Bahamas or something, uh, we are we are in exile. Then where are our children to be born? In exile. So let's not blame God that we are born in a state of separation from God. That's a result of the fact that man was exiled from the garden. And worse than that, there was that sword with an angel, and there was nothing mankind could do to get back into the garden. Nothing. So, and that is what happened. That uh, uh, they were sent into exile, and they, the gate was, pr was protected by an angel with a flaming sword, and then we are born in exile. And at that point, God still loved us. Yes. But it, it, it's just that it seems harsh, you know. Uh, somebody makes a mistake, I pay for it. <laughs> well, know? when you're in that uninhabited <laughs> island in the Bahamas, <laughs> say that to your father. <laughs> you know, why I am born in exile, child, hush him out. You have to be where I am. All right? It's no place else a child can be born but where yes, his parents yes, are. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we're born in exile. Okay. But then God said, I will place enmity. He said to the serpent, I'll place enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and hers. He will crush your head, even though you will hurt his heel. That's Genesis 3.15, the famous prophecy of the coming of the Redeemer. And that's what I call God's plan B. God's plan A was Adam and Eve. They would serve him. They would love him and serve him in happiness all the days of their life. And then they'll simply pass into heaven. Plan A. Didn't work, Adam and Eve rebelled. Plan B came up. God would send a redeemer. But he had to prepare the world for the coming of that redeemer. And so he made a series of covenants with the people. So we see that trend. He began now to prepare the world for the big covenant through Jesus, his son, by preparing the world with preliminary covenants. And the first one was with, was with well, it's not the first one, but anyway, the big one was with Abraham. And then he made one with um, the, the, the Jewish people through, through Moses. Now it's interesting, yeah, the covenant that God made through Abraham, which was with Abraham, yes, but with Abraham and his descendants. And when it came to make a covenant with Moses, God sent Moses to Pharaoh to say, set my people free. And if you read the story in the book of Exodus, the covenant that God makes through Moses is with the people. It is a, a, a relationship that God wants to build with the people. At first it was Abraham and his descendants, and then now it has narrowed down, if you like, to the, to the, the people of Judah, of the tribe of Judah, who, became, who were the Hebrews, and they were in slavery in Egypt. And then God set them free. So it's not just a covenant with Moses we're talking about. No. The covenant is the bigger covenant than Moses. The, yes, and the covenant is, it's much true to say that the covenant was through Moses. Okay. God sent Moses to the people to set them free. And he said, set my people free, and I will take them to a land flowing with milk and honey, the land that belongs to the Jebusites and the Hittites and the Moabites and the whole, whole set of other ites. Okay? I'm going to give you that land as your own. So bring the people out to me. So with a lot of trouble, Pharaoh eventually was glad to get rid of them, then repented. Anyway, they eventually got out and they went through the desert. Now I have a drawing, okay, mm -hmm. to show you this. Okay. Let me see if I can get this Let's drawing see. on the screen. There we go. So this is a drawing of mm -hmm. the Old Covenant, right? Now I got the drawing to come up. The next trick is to get the pointer to come up on the screen too. Ah, there we go. So here we have a drawing of that Old Covenant with Moses. You have the people, this is Egypt, I eh? have two pyramids oh, and okay. how you like my palm tree? Yes, 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 man. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, as I told you, my drawings are very primitive. <laughs> so here are the, the, the Hebrew people in slavery in Egypt. 
And God sends Moses to them, so here's Moses, and he gives them my stuff, and you remember the stuff, changing into yes, a soup, yes, and all yes. kind of thing. He, he did a lot of miracles with his stuff. So that's Moses with his stuff being sent to the people who were in slavery in Egypt. The writing here is a little small, and you might be able to make it out, but that's what's written there, slavery in Egypt. Right. So Moses got the people, and can look at him here again, to follow him across the Red Sea. And you remember that famous miracle? Yeah. how the Jewish people were able to get across the Red Sea and then the Egyptians who followed them later on were drowned, according to the story as we have it in the Bible. So Moses brought them, led them out of, out of Egypt and uh, he brought them into the, into the desert. You know, and, and that desert, the, the, the people going there, you know, they really needed faith and trust in God because Pharaoh took off after them. And they were stuck in front of the sea. And then Pharaoh started coming behind him and they got yes. real vexed. And they went to Moses and said, what you bring us out here for to die? We could have just yeah. as well have died in Egypt. Yes. That's what God maybe said to them. Um, so Moses went by God, the people complaining. And you know something, they have a good they have a reason to complain. God says, listen, eh? you see you, Lead, tell my people to go forward. Forward. That's the Red Sea in front of them, you know. And they say, Pharaoh come in behind him and they go forward, how are they going forward? And then you know the story, David spread his, um, Moses put his rod across the sea and it separated yes. and the people went forward. But it must have taken enormous courage because when they did get across the Red Sea, where do you think they're going? Straight into a desert, on no man's land. Mm -hmm. No man's land. No man can control it. Only God controlled it. And God is saying, come to a land that I am in control. And forget about Egypt. And that took a lot of things, all those people going into a desert. Mm -hmm. So he brought them to Mount Sinai. And there in Mount Sinai, he called Moses up the mountain. And there was a big um, lightning and thunder and earthquake. Yes, yes. Well, I tried to show that there, yeah, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think I got this kind of a drawing from the weather maps. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, you have, you have the, um, the, the, the storm cloud yes. and, and the voice of God coming like thunder. And, it, you know, a couple of days ago we celebrated the Epiphany, epiphany okay? Yes. This was an Epiphany. Epiphany yes, means yes. God showing forth Himself forth and His power. His power. Well, this is yeah. God's big Epiphany in the Old Testament. Yeah. So, He called Moses up to the, to the mountain. And it's interesting. When Moses got to the mountain, uh, God said to him, you know, I am choosing your pe my people. Of all the nations in the world, I'm choosing them to be my very own people. The whole world belongs to me, but I'm choosing them. But they must listen to my voice, mm -hmm. and they must obey my covenant. Mm -hmm. And he told Moses all the things that he wanted the people to do. So Moses went down. I hear the story now from the book of Exodus, chapter 19, verse 7. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together, we will do everything the Lord has said. You're talking about agreement? Yeah. Voluntary Serious relationship. Agreement. Mm -hmm. And so here you have the people expressing the agreement, okay, with God. And then God tells to Moses that I will take them to land. And that's God's commitment. I will take them to land flowing in milk and honey. And their commitment is we will do everything the Lord has said. What does that declaration uh, entail? We will do everything the Lord has said. Well, maybe the, the, the Israelites at the time didn't have too clear an idea of what it meant. But notice the next line in the verse, and the thing was, so Moses brought the answer back to God. So God said, right, I'm glad to hear that. Now this is what they must do. Thou shalt have no strange gods before me. All right. Thou shalt not take my name in vain. Keep holy the Sabbath day. Honor your father and mother. And he gave them the tablets with the, his laws written on them. At that point, the Jews knew exactly what their commitment was. This is it written. So here we have Moses on the mountainside with his staff. These two tablets, well, they're kind of big. What is it? Hard to draw them smaller. So these are the two tablets. And the people with their arms raised here are expressing agreement. agreement. Okay? And they, um, they're now here. God here in this epiphany up here. Moses is a mediator. And he's telling them what God wants. And they are agreeing, and their hands are raised, their arms are raised in, in, in an expression of adoration and agreement. So this is Mount Sinai. The Bible calls this the covenant. Yes. The Old New Testament calls it the Old Covenant. Yes. But at the time this was happening, it was just the covenant, because there was no 
other covenant for it to be compared with. And these people now, by their agreement with God, have become the people of God. Was there any other symbol to seal this covenant? Well, there, there were, yes. God, for example, um, told him to build a tent for him. Mm -hmm. And then he would live in the tent. Okay. And then when he wanted them to, as a sign, a visible sign of his presence amongst them, he fed them, he gave them quails to eat, he gave them the, the water flowing from the rock. His side of the bargain was to look after them and bring them to the promised land. Yes. Unfortunately, they were consistently disobedient too. And there's the element of sacrifice. And after that's that, right, the, the sacrifice. And, oh, yeah, that's, I'm glad you mentioned that, of course. There was that sacrifice. There was that sacrifice that Moses then offered at the foot of a hill, at the, at the foot of the hill, where he offered a bull, you know, and he, um, he, he got the blood from the, from the, the bull. Now, mm -hmm. blood. For the Hebrew people, the life is in the blood. The blood is the life. The two words are practically synonymous mm -hmm. for an animal. Blood, mm -hmm. life. We speak today, I'll give my life blood for that. You know, we also have the expression relating life with the blood. Now, when, they, when Moses uh, when offered that sacrifice, the, um, he took the blood, the life of the victim, and he sprinkled some on the altar. The altar represented God's presence amongst them. And then he sprinkled the rest of it on the people. Mm. So they were united. God, represented by the altar, God and the people now, are united through the blood of the victim. Okay. Which is the same as saying they were united through the life of the victim. Which is the same as saying the victim gave its life Oh. to bring the people and God together. together. He gave its blood. Now we're going to see that in the New Covenant in a, few, yes. in a short while. Yes. We're going to see how, where that parallel is in the New Covenant. Yes. Okay? But that sacrifice expressed their, their total dedication to doing the will of God. There are several reasons for that, um, and I don't have time, I think, to go into all of them. But one of the things was when God made a covenant with Abraham, he, they had animals slaughtered as well. And then God walked up and down in between the animals. In between, yes. Now, that was a, a sacrificial ritual that was inherited from the people before the time of the Bible. And what it really was, was it was a, in the form of a self-curse. Mm -hmm. That they, they slaughtered the animals and they put them there, and then the two people come into the argument would walk up and down between the animals, implying, let that be done to me that has been done to the these animals, animals if I am not faithful to this agreement. Mm -hmm. Okay? And that's one of the big things about sacrifice. There are others, another big thing too, but I'll speak about, to me, what is the most beautiful thing or the, 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 the most powerful thing about sacrifice. Uh, but I won't speak about that tonight. I will speak about it the next time. Okay, okay so we move through Abraham, through Moses, and now the next covenant. Well, we have this one, but before I can get to the next covenant, I want to say, okay, so God brought the people to the promised land where they renewed their covenant with Joshua. But once again, they're not taking on God. Yes. They went and they followed the false gods of all the people that were environed in the land, and God sent judges after them, and the endless supply of people, prophets, bringing them back to the proper worship of the one true God that they were supposed to be doing since the Ten Commandments on Sinai constantly coming back and back and back. And eventually, as God said, fell up, look, you know what? In the, in the quiver, you know, kind of tired of you all now. And he threatened that he would suspend this covenant. Mm -hmm. And eventually he did just that. And he took away the land. The very land that was a big sign to the whole world that this was his people. He took it away and they went into exile. And in exile, they eventually and at last, they had a change of heart. In exile, they began reflecting in themselves through the help of the prophets that God sent to them at that time about all the wrong things that they had done. And gradually, they came to understand that the service of God meant a service of God from within their own hearts. And when that conversion happened, God sent them more prophets to promise them mm -hmm. that he would renew his relationship with them or establish, in fact, a new relationship with them. And he has that. He, um, the, the, the prophets have that, and the, the, the passage I find that's one of the best illustrating it is uh, the promise that comes in um, through Ezekiel yes. and Jeremiah. But Ezekiel, I have Ezekiel's quotation here, it's a little long, 
But one of the most celebrated passages, to me anyway, of the, of the promise of a new covenant is to be found in Ezekiel. It's in chapter 36, so if you want to be able to look it up, and it is verses 24 to 28. Mm -hmm. So Ezekiel, in the name of God, puts, you know, speaking for God, says, I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back to your own land. Hear this. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. No, we can see a reference there in the future. Mm -hmm. baptism. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. yes. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. So part of the new covenant is going to be forgiveness of sin. Cleansing. Okay. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. A new spirit. He doesn't mm -hmm. say which. Yeah. Until I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. The tablets, God's law is written on tablets of stone. And God is here now comparing the hearts mm -hmm. of the Jewish people with those same tablets of stone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he says, no, I'm going to take away your heart, your, tablet, your heart of stone, and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. Human. Okay? Well, the new law is going to be a law of love. Yes. Tell me, where else can you write a law of love but in a heart right. of flesh? Okay? So, I will take, remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Yes. And then hear this, I will put my spirit in you. So the spirit he's going to give is my spirit. I'm going to put my spirit in you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. That's the covenant again. You will live in the land I gave your forefathers. And you will be my people, and I will be your God. Oh, and that really phrase, you will be my people, and I will be your God, that's the relationship that God is going to establish again. Okay, now that phrase, you will be my people, and I will be your God, occurs about 29 times in those words in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. A constant, that is a formula, if you like, to the covenant. describe the covenant. The covenant formula. The relationship, yes, yes. and that relationship with God, the two sides of that relationship, God and us, or God and his people, and the basis for the relationship is that trust in God, that confidence in God that it requires, and on our side, that obedience to his will, yes. obedience to his law. And that, that is the, the thing presented there, where there was rebellion and disobedience at first, and now we're required to Has submit. Has to come back to that. Yes. Yes. The only way you submit. can get around a rebellion yes. is through submission. Yes. So Adam and Eve then had rebelled against God, and that rebellion had to be cancelled. This, will, this would be done by the total loving obedience of Jesus, Son of God, and the new Adam. New Adam. So how did Jesus go about yes. doing that, undoing the rebellion of Adam? Yes. So let's see if we can build up this picture now. It goes, yeah. All right. It, it's, it, it decided to cooperate. It's a little bit like man's rebellion here. Yeah. While, while it, <laughs> yes. No, I wanted to, um, even though we say we want people to participate by calling in, eh, even though uh, we want to get through some, some more stuff here towards the end, but perhaps we can entertain a question or two as you go along, Father Farfa. People I'll can think willing, of their questions I'll, and they can call in. Yes. I will. Try to address every question. Yes. Hopefully I will have some kind of an answer to it. Let's see how we get into the new covenant. Here. All right. Well, what we hmm. have here now on our screen is a very elegant drawing of Mount Calvary. Artistic. Okay. <laughs> so we're onto the screen, yes. We're onto the screen. This elegant drawing of Mount Calvary, Calvary here. And of course, what really we were redeemed by the entire life of Christ his total loving obedience to his father from the very beginning to the very end. But the climax of that, the focal point, the, the focal point is best, the summit, if you like, of that, that expression of loving obedience to his father is on Calvary. So that's Calvary, and on Calvary, we are going to see, witness the event. That's the cross, of course, and we know that on Calvary, Jesus is crucified. So. I have the unfortunate job, if you like, of putting Jesus on the cross. He's doing a good okay. job. Okay. There he is. Hey. Okay. Mm. Represent. Pretty good. So yeah. Jesus is there on his cross. Now this, this Jesus on the cross is the central point of history. It is the most important event mm -hmm. 
in the history of mankind is this death of Christ on the cross. Now, I'm a teacher, and I remember if I want to bring something out very important for, for the kids in my class, in an essay where they make a mistake, for example, mm -hmm. I don't want to draw their attention to it, I put a circle around it. The circle is to emphasize the importance, and I want to emphasize the importance of the death of Christ. So I'll use my traditional method, which is a circle. The circle simply indicates to us at this point that this is a very important moment in the history of the world. Now, what makes this thing important is that um, you have obedience. The, the circle is also the O of the word obedience. Mm. And we have from St. Paul that, that as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience, many will be made yeah, righteous. Yes. Okay, so that's the obedience mm. of Christ. Okay. Now, you know, you have different kinds of obedience. Eh? A child can be afraid of his parents because he's going to get licks. Or a fella can be afraid of his girlfriend because he's going to hurt her. He's not going to love him anymore. He's not afraid of any licks. You can have obedience through fear, or you can have obedience through love. Now, what was the obedience of Christ? Okay, yes. well, I suppose the answer it would be very obvious. That O, which is the first letter of the word obedience, is also the heart of the word love. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have love. And in St. John's Gospel, Jesus says to his apostles, the world must be brought to know that I love the Father and that what I am doing, I am doing exactly what the Father told me. So we are redeemed by the loving obedience of Christ. So, so in other words, Father, if Christ did not take it right to the end, being obedient right even unto death, then we would not have been, we would not reap the fruits Correct. of what God really wanted. Correct. It, it would have been a second failure of mankind. Because you, would, you, you need a total, a total sacrifice to be able to redeem for what was... Uh, total rebellion. For the total rebellion. That's right. And Christ, therefore, was obedient, as St. Paul tells us in the letter to the Philippians, he became obedient unto death. Not just any death, the death on a cross. So in, a, in, a, in, so in essence, we should, we should rejoice because of that. Of that it's uh, called Good Friday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's okay. right. All right, and we are we are horrified at the crime that was committed that's against right. the Son of God. Mm -hmm. But we look at that crime and say that God can write straight with crooked lines. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's the loving obedience. But not only, as we mentioned before in the prophecy of Ezekiel, forgiveness has to be involved. God cannot reunite us with Himself. He is all holy unless there is also forgiveness. So we have a very useful circle on the screen here because it is not only the heart of love, so it is not only the first letter of obedience, but oh, it is also the O-N, okay. forgiveness. Okay? And Jesus Christ in whom, through his blood, we gain our freedom, which is namely the forgiveness of our sins. Yes. That freedom was lost to Adam and Eve. Huh? And That's right. And it's to the extent that we are submitting to God that we will regain true freedom. Yes. And otherwise, we're still in slavery to sin. St. Paul says that all over the place, slaves to sin. Mm -hmm. So, but there's more to it than that. Mm -hmm. That's Jesus isolated on a cross. However, what we now have is in the statement that St. Paul makes, well, it's in the author to the Hebrews. Jesus, having been made perfect, he became for all who obey him the source of eternal salvation. God who created us without us will not save us without us. Mm. We need now to make a conscious submission to God. And the way this is drawn here, right. we, Jesus gathers us yes. into the circle of his obedience. Yes. It's important to be in the circle. That we have to be drawn into that circle of obedience. I can see Celia and I can see myself <laughs> and I can see you there, Father. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So that that's, um, Jesus has drawn us into the circle of his obedience by his intention. Now, that total obedience of him on the cross is his ratifying of that relationship with God. But there is more. There is more because in that prophecy from Ezekiel, not only we heard about the forgiveness of sin, but we also heard about the gift of the Holy Spirit. Yes. So here's the Holy Spirit. And why do I draw the Holy Spirit there? Well, in St. John's Gospel, Jesus is in the temple one day. And a big feast, and, and the most important day of the feast, we are told in, jo in John chapter 7, verses 37 and 38. Jesus says, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow for living, for, for, uh, rivers of living water. 
Now, rivers of living water are symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Now, I'm not just telling you that from me, in case you want to doubt me. That, that is John 7, 37 to 38. Yes. Listen to John in verse 39. This he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him he would receive. Yes. Those believing in him. Okay. So that the, the, the redemption then is the gift of the Holy Spirit on those who believe. And we are now elsewhere Jesus speaks of water. The Bible constantly uses flowing water as a sign of the gift of the Holy Spirit. And in baptism the priest is warned, eh? Make sure that water you pour on the child flows. It is a flowing water that is the sign of the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's a beautiful chapter in Ezekiel's prophecy about that too. So that's where where we are there. That the Holy Spirit is given flowing from the side of Christ. It is there that the church is born. Mm -hmm. We are told by the um, early saints of the church and by the Vatican Council that the, that the church was born from the side of Christ as he lay in death on the cross, okay. just as Eve was born from the side of Adam as he lay in sleep in the Garden of Eden. There's two components of the new covenant, huh? the yeah. Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's right. And the forgiveness of sins through That's right. the redemption. Yeah. Good. So now this then is a drawing indicating, in fact, this is the redemption. This is a mystery of Calvary, our reunion with God through the loving obedience of Christ and the forgiveness of sin, mm -hmm. the gift of the Holy Spirit to us, our gathering into the circle of Christ's obedience. This is the meaning of Calvary. This is where the new covenant has come into being yes. at this time in history. Okay, yeah. And uh, this is what we must understand if we're going to understand the Mass. Mm -hmm. So this is the redemption, and as a result of the redemption, what we have is the new people of God. Yes. The new people of God. Now, where is this voluntary thing going to come in? Mm -hmm. We are supposed to be part of the new people of God. Somehow, we are going to have to express, to express, as Celia brought up several times earlier, it, it, it's, we have to express our agreement with the covenant. How are we going to do that? The covenant took place in Calvary, I don't know, 4,000, 5,000, I don't know how far, thousands of miles away. And above all, it took, it took place 2,000 years ago. True. How are we now to express our agreement with this covenant? Because we are saying we are being called into a voluntary covenant, a voluntary relationship with God. We have to express our agreement. Yes, we can express it. We can kneel on and say our prayers. We can say our rosary. We can tell God we are sorry for our sins. But that's not the heart of the covenant. Those are all consequences of the covenant. Okay. But the heart of the covenant itself took place on Calvary. We need to express our agreement at that point. And Jesus, in giving us the mass, says, do this in memory of me. And that opens the whole next talk that we have. Yes. Because it is the Mass that is, the expression. that is, because we are taught by the Church that the Mass is the same sacrifice as Calvary. It is not that Calvary is not being repeated. Calvary, the same sacrifice on Calvary is being brought to us in our churches on our altars. Mm -hmm. That sacrifice of Calvary is coming to us. Just so we can no longer say, well, I wasn't there, I couldn't do nothing about it. You are there. Every time you go to Mass, you are at that moment in history when new covenant was enacted by Christ. And the question is, do you want to be part of this? If you say yes, you can't stay home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's like each time you get a chance to voluntarily recommit to that covenant, to that covenant relationship via Mass. Exactly. Um, That's, and that is what the Mass is. Now, when you look at the Mass, you don't see that in the Mass. No. It's, it's right? So what I, we now have to do is to take a look at the Mass and see what is there about the Mass that makes it to be an expression, our expression of concurrence, of agreement with the sacrifice on Calvary. Mm -hmm. For the very beginning, we said uh, that the sacraments, according to Vatican II, as, they, as we are taught, the sacraments don't merely express the faith, but nourish and strengthen it. And you spoke of the, of the importance of the Holy Spirit, along with yeah. forgiveness. We receive the gift of the Holy Spirit at baptism, and I expect as we go along, we get some uh, a way to strengthen that? Well, okay, I have another last slide. Oh. Okay, this is the new people of God. Now, ta-da, 
if you look at that, you might say, well, that's the Old Covenant again, but it's not. In the Old Covenant, on the side over here, we had um, the, e the Jews in Egypt, the Hebrews in Egypt, right? right? Mm -hmm. And slavery. Yeah, now, St. Paul tells us, it's, a, it's slavery to sin. Yeah. So this is a non serviam This is the I will not serve motto. This is, this is the original fall. There, our human rebellion yeah. is shown here. Then, we are then brought across no longer the Red Sea. These are the waters of baptism. And we are led through the waters of baptism by Christ. This is a Cairo sign that you see sometimes in the liturgy. It looks like a P and an X, but it's not really. Mm -hmm. It's a CH and an R. The Greek people write funny ways. Christ. Right? <laughs> That's Christ. Yes. And uh, so through baptism, we are brought. Now, this is a drawing we had just now. Certainly. This is the yes. moment of the redemption. That's, this is the redemption. It is a new covenant. And we are the new people of God shown in here. Yes. Okay? And this is the Holy Spirit being given to us. And then we are led by Christ through the desert, which is the Christian life. And here we, we have a, a lot of problems to face. And so we have a gift of the Holy Spirit helping us with it. And we have the other sacraments as well. Uh, that along the way here, on this difficult road, steep hill going up to the kingdom of heaven, mm -hmm. God continues to be with us and to help us. And the promise is, I will take you to a land flowing in milk and honey. In this case, the land flowing in milk and honey, you know, Palestine. The land flowing in milk and honey is the kingdom of heaven. In a, in, in a way, Father, you know, the way it's expressed there, even it sounds like a good romance, you know, <laughs> that has a beautiful ending. Well, it's it is just exactly that. About it. it is a romance between God and us in yeah, spite yeah, of our is, infidelities. Yeah, the is. extent that he reaches to forgive us and to ensure nonetheless all those sacraments, okay? And leading us into the kingdom of heaven. So this is a new covenant. Now, where does the mass fit in to this? That'll mm. be the topic of our next next talk. Mm. Well, we just have a few minutes. If you have a question, perhaps we can entertain that question now uh, before we bring today's lesson to an end. Questions to Father Farfa? Yes, Father Farfa. But let me ask. Let me ask you, Father. The the old covenant. Where is it exp is it expressed in our liturgy at all in in mass? The old covenant. Is there any direct expression of that old covenant at all? On Sundays there are three readings. Yes. Okay. There's one from the Old Testament, ah, one from the New. Okay. And now the Old Testament readings, you know, have reference to the old covenant. But in every case, what has happened is that the old covenant readings, the first reading is linked with the gospel. Yes. Which is telling us that the new good news of the gospel grows out of the, 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 the news of the old covenant. Okay. Okay. And, um, and then there's a second reading on Sundays, there's a, the th a second of three and that reading also. It doesn't really explicitly have anything to do with either of the other two, but very frequently it provides a little kind of a, of a subsidiary thought that helps you to understand the first and the third. And then there's always the psalm, which is always from the Old Testament as well. So we are constantly reminded, and then there are rituals in the Mass, particularly the ritual of sacrifice, which we, we need to have it explained, which is an Old Testament ritual. Mm. Next, next, next talk, when we have a talk in the Mass, and we're going to see in detail what the Mass really is, what is happening in that church when we are there, what is it that's actually happening? Okay. Yeah. You will see that the whole thing is, is, you cannot separate the New Covenant from the Old in the Mass. It's, it's difficult to see Mass the same way, you know, I, I guess now I would, I would be looking to see that kind of covenant relationship and how it is expressed as, as you go to Mass now, yeah. but it should be very interesting looking at it. Well, next week we'll give you a lot to think about when it comes to the Mass, yes. a lot to think about. Mm. You want to say yep. something else? No, you have oh, a question? Throughout, no, it just uh, occurs to me that throughout your talk, throughout your lesson, you know, the concepts of, of the celebration, the sacrifice, the participation, and you used a word uh, at the beginning about assisting at Mass. Yeah. Uh, in the French language, I know we talk about assisting. Uh, in English, it's the same thing here. What is our role in the celebration, in the sacrifice? What do we bring to the process? 
You know, that's next week's talk. Yes. Actually, so, that's all of yeah, I can, are I can, up. And, uh, Yes. Well, I'm glad because yes. what's happening here is that you're beginning to see a, a little glimmer yes. that of the things that mm -hmm. I am saying. You, you had asked a question earlier in this, this evening, you know, that, you know, about, uh, again, about the mass. What has this got to do with the mass? But you are beginning to see yes. uh, the, um, the, in the talk of the covenant, you're beginning to see certain rituals that will come up at the mass. And, um, but I, I really, I wouldn't begin to have time to go into them yes, now. Yes, yes. But I promise you, we will deal a lot now. From now on, this is the background, as I said, you remember at the beginning, I said the mass is a summit, and we needed to go up the different base camps to get there. Well, we have achieved the second, this is the, the last the, of the base camps. To just go up a little bit further, would you encourage, I mean, you've just gone through basically the whole Old Testament there. What kind of encouragement would you give, especially for young people, to want to go and l examine the old so that they would have a better understanding? Is, would you feel it's necessary for it us to... I vital. To I, I tend to explain it this way, okay? You ever read murder stories, mystery stories? <laughs> I don't know who's your favorite detective. <laughs> but to look at the New Testament without understanding or going for the old, it's like reading a murder mystery in the final chapter. Yes, yes. And you miss the whole build-up. You miss the... Uh, the you, yes, you get a, a, an explanation of the whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. But you cannot appreciate that unless you have followed the story throughout from the beginning. Yes. And I'm saying you cannot appreciate the New Testament without an appreciation of the Old Testament. And people say, well, I, I can't read the Old Testament. It's very difficult. Well, one way to do it is uh, like in the Jerusalem Bible. You can pick a theme. Yes and read the Old Testament in themes, instead of saying, I'm starting in Genesis and I'm going to end right, up with the Book right, of Maccabees. Right, right. You know, pick a theme and you find the theme of covenant, that is a fabulous theme to follow. Yes. If you want to choose another theme in the Old Testament, choose living water as a sign of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Look mm -hmm. up living water and, uh, well, your, your community here. Mm -hmm. And that read the Old Testament in themes makes it easier. To plod through it book by book by book is very difficult. Yeah. I did it once in my life. I read the entire Bible from once at the beginning to the end. But I'm not about to do that a second time. Even as um, you know, we, we understand Jesus saying um, that he came to fulfill, that's this right. makes it even clearer. Exactly. You I know, have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill that's it. That's right. That's right. And even when you, you, you mentioned him being the new Adam, then it all connects, it just connects the whole thing. That's right. And so it's a total picture, it's not... And this picture that we have on our screen at the moment, I don't know if we can come back just for a moment, this picture that we can get, if we can get it on the screen, is um, so like the picture that we had for the Old Covenant. Yes. It is meant to draw out the parallel between the two. And as a matter of fact, St. Um, uh, Paul, says, advises us to look at the Old Testament, and he says, what happened to them, happened to them as a pattern for us. So St. Paul, inspired also by the Holy Spirit, yes. is saying that what we see here on the screen is patterned after the Old Testament. I don't know, maybe next week when I come, I'll put both the drawings on the, on the screen at the same time, and you can see the parallel. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, Father, certainly it was an interesting lesson. Uh, you know, I, I don't know how many of us really take the time to delve deep into the story, into the history, and see the patterns and the trends. Um, you know, really an interesting perspective, and as our key film prompts us, motivation to think and meditate deeply and to go back. Yeah, because, yeah. you know, you, you read and you hear about Moses and especially yeah. characters from the Old Testament, yeah. and you think, well, you know, I don't need to read. I don't, why do I need to go? Let me just go to the, yeah, so let me just go to the back the, of the book. We often miss the trends, eh? We <laughs> yes, often yes. miss the trends. And yet, you like know, a, from what came out there, it's so important You're like a student in maths class. You're looking up the answer book. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Without yes. trying to work Working things out, out yes. Yes. straight from the question to the reasons. <laughs> okay, yeah. 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 Yes. So now we're beginning <laughs> to appreciate like the, the true significance of the Eucharist and not be bedazzled, as you told us earlier. What are our responsibilities, our mm -hmm. obligations, and understanding God's obligations to us? Well, certainly the Eucharist here is so much, I hope I'll be able to get through it in one talk, right? Mm -hmm. There is so much to be said about yeah. the Mass in the yeah. context of covenant. Yes. Mass in the context of covenant, not in the context of Sunday obligation, right? Yes. But well, 
-hmm. We understand why the church makes it a Sunday obligation. Yes. When yes. we begin to understand that the Mass is the sacrifice of Christ made present so that we can say yes to it. Yes, yes. so we're so grateful for uh, the obedience of Christ mm -hmm. <laughs> that we can celebrate now eh? and we have that redemption. So, so, let's, so let's, let's challenge people. Let's challenge people to go and do a little review, go and yeah. do a little, just a little research on Moses and uh, that old Abraham covenant. And David. And, and, yeah, yeah, just go and do so that next week they'll be all ready. Sharp. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we thank our teacher, Father Jared Farfer, and my brother Keith Patrick. I'm Celia Regis, wishing you a pleasant evening. <laughs>